Okay, I believe we're live. So hello and welcome to Creakham Solar Farm. Um, I'm Dr. Natalie Whitehead and uh, we, I'm joined by a wonderful, um, inspiring range of engineers and site experts who are joining us today. So I think we're going to be doing some quick introductions to introduce everybody who will be talking to you today. I'm a, uh, one of the founders and directors of Exeter Science Centre alongside my colleague Alice. Um, I finished my PhD in physics before I did this and before that I did a, an undergraduate degree in physics both at the University of Exeter and before that I was an engineer um, at, in Southampton trying to make sustainable buildings. So I've been an engineer and a physicist and I've learnt so much from both, uh, from both topics. Um, over to you Alice. Hello, I'm Dr Alice Mills. Um, I I'm one of the founders and directors of Exeter Science Centre. I used to be an astrophysicist and then got really into science communication, worked as an outreach officer for science at Exeter University and now I'm working alongside Natalie um, and yeah, delighted to be here today. So I'm going to hand over to Tracy first. Morning everybody, my name's Tracy Ebrill and I'm the Consultant Operations Manager here at Creekham Solar Farm. Um, I had an unusual career path to get me here today, so I started in banking at 15 and then I went into aviation for 10 years and then I decided to give something back to the planet because my carbon footprint was huge after being in aviation. So I went into environmental and conser um, conservation uh, and the charitable sector. So that's how I've ended up here today. I'm going to pass you over to Ray. Hello, I'm uh, Ray Holland. I'm the technical director for Yelm Community Energy, which means I'm trying to make sure that all this equipment uh, is working as it's supposed to, and if anything goes wrong, it gets fixed quickly. Uh, I started out as an electrical engineer, training, had my degree at the Royal Naval Engineering College in Plymouth, which sadly is not here anymore. And uh, so I'm resp responsible for designing and maintaining equipment in ships. There's a lot of electronic and electrical equipment. And then I changed direction completely and worked with people in Asia and Africa and Latin America on uh, bringing electricity to uh, villages and towns which didn't have it w using renewable energy. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Adam Feldman and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter's Cornwall campus near to Penryn. And what we do is uh, invent stuff and research stuff all to do with engineering and especially energy. And we also, very importantly, teach people all about our inventions and how to be great engineers. We've seen some really interesting career paths, and actually I've got a very odd one as well, because I started off as a human engineer, an orthopaedic surgeon, mending people, but now I try to mend and develop strange and exciting pieces of energy engineering. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. David Jenkins. I'm at the University of Plymouth um, and I'm uh, in the uh, Wolfson Nanomaterials and uh, Nano Devices Laboratory. I mean, I'm, I'm originally a, a physicist, now I'm, I kind of masquerade as an engineer sometimes. And, uh, but my, 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 my passion is making a difference and I like to work with sort of uh, nanomaterials for sensors. We heard about Africa. I, I, I do a lot of work in India on uh, trying to improve uh, water quality in rural communities, but also work on uh, sort of biosensors and uh, solar solar cells and, and teaching sort of solar renewable energy. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Dr. Katie Shanks and I work at the University of Exeter alongside uh, Adam Fieldman and I study solar energy panels and new types of technology to make them more advanced and more efficient and also integrate them more into buildings for sustainable development. Um, and I really like the problem solving aspect of it. So looking at new materials and optics as well to try and focus light onto so smaller solar panels um, all to do with uh, making them expand further so we can use them everywhere and have clean energy everywhere. Hello, my name is uh, Richard Ellis. I'm from Goldback Solar. I'm in charge of the um, operation and maintenance and pre-construction and warranty section of the op of the Creacom Solar Farm. I've been involved in photovoltaics since 20, 2005. Um, prior to that, I was an electrical engineer. 
uh, kind of devoting my life or my my later life to um, photovoltaics in the in the pursuit of sort of cleaning up the planet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have a range of fantastic science and engineering people here today. What we're going to talk about is energy, and I think quite a few of you have been looking at energy with your teachers over the recent days and weeks. What is energy? It's the stuff that makes things work. It makes your car drive, the aeroplane fly, the light come out of the light on the ceiling. It makes your telephone work. It even makes us work. We need energy to drive us. Now we have a problem with energy. We're here very close to Plymouth where 300 years ago in 1720 the steam engine was invented just outside Dartmouth by a guy called Thomas Newcomen. At that stage onwards, we started using a lot of fossil fuels to make our energy. And as you know, we use a lot of coal over the past couple of hundred years, oil, gas, burning peat. And as a result, we've gradually, we've got a lot of useful stuff out of those machines, but we've gradually polluted our planet. And the carbon dioxide released is leading to that problem that you'll have all been hearing about, global warming. So we're going into our next energy revolution. It's called renewable energy. What is renewable energy? It's the types of energy that are sustainable and reconstituted almost as quickly as, as we use them up. There are seven types, but I'll just mention a couple of them. One of them is solar energy, one of them is wind energy, wave energy, biomass and so on. But today we're talking about solar energy. And some of you have, I think, been building solar ovens. You've been seeing how we can capture sunshine to heat things up to even cook our dinner. Well, today we're looking at these devices, these machines. These are called photovoltaic panels. Not a totally new idea. They were invented back in the early Victorian period. Uh, but they've got much better in recent times. And we're going to see how today we're going to explain to you how a photovoltaic panel captures sunshine, renewable energy, and turns it into electricity. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adam. And um, we are really excited to be here with you. And we really hope that you can send us your questions. It's really important to send those into us and we can ask our experts as we go through. So what are you going to be learning about today? First of all, we're going to be asking your questions all the way through. So, so uh, whatever you want to know about, but also um, we're going to be meeting, first of all, Tracy and Ray, who uh, run the Creekham Solar Farm uh, as part of the community, uh, community owned solar farm. We're also going to be seeing how solar power works and what these things are made of. Um, then you guys are going to be doing a challenge in 10 minutes, so a time pressured engineering challenge where you get to learn a little bit more about the tilt and the position of the solar panels. Then we're going to meet our site expert, Richard, who is going to tell us all about that and, um, and see if, you're, if you got the right idea when it comes to how you position these panels. And then we're going to be speaking to Katie and David, who are our researchers, um, who are doing some amazing amazing work in uh, in the future of solar energy. So I'm going to pass over to Alice now who's going to speak to Tracy and Ray. Cool, so, <laughs> so we've got Tracy and Ray here um, and thank you so much for joining us. So really, first I want to know, Tracy, where are we? <laughs> we are in not so sunny South Devon today and we are on 27 acres. Sorry, we forgot that, that was a technical was hit, wasn't it? <laughs> um, we are in sunny South Devon and we are just north of Holberton and very near to Yelmpton. And we have 27 acres here of low grade uh, soil with which we've put, constructed a solar farm. And our solar farm here today is also having a biodiversity survey happening. So it's all happening. We've got lovely wildflowers here going hand in hand, nature and renewable energy. Wonderful. That's so great. So, um, so yeah, 27, do you say, how many 27 acres? 27 acres. acres. It's enormous. Um, so, so why here? Why now? Like, what's, why this project? 
Um, so the site was identified that um, with uh, the long-term aim of getting into community ownership, we didn't want big corporate companies to just own all our electricity companies. We knew that the community could do it ourselves. So we are embarking on an 18-month project to try and get these into community ownership. And any surplus that we make from selling all of our electricity will be donated back and we can support local projects, local communities, school groups and really exciting projects on our doorstep. That's fantastic. What a brilliant project. Um, so Ray, um, tell us a bit more about, about the site. How, how much power do you, do you generate here? Well, over a year, the site will generate the equivalent of what uh, 2,000 houses use in a year. So um, that's quite a lot. So that's uh, a, a equivalent of um, some 2,000 houses having uh, their own solar panels. Yeah, fantastic. And, and what, what brought you to this? What's been your path into engineering? Well, I, uh, as I said earlier, I was um, working in uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America, and that was on uh, community projects in places where which didn't have electricity at all. So we were using renewable energy, originally water power, and anybody who's been to the Dart Valley Country Park will be able to see um, water turbine there, which is, because this uh, technology we were using came from South Devon. And um, later on we were using solar power because uh, the price of solar panels came down and down and down and it's still going down so um, now we can generate electricity in scattered units all over the country instead of having these huge power stations brilliant um nat have we got any questions at this point we haven't had any yet, yet. no questions Thanks. yet well don't forget this is why we're live so that you can ask your questions live to this fantastic group of experts so um so yeah please do pop them in the chat and we'll we'll make sure we try and get to answering them Brilliant. So, I think I've asked you all my questions. <laughs> oh yeah, did you have did you have a toy to show us? I have got a toy to show you. This is um, from 20 years ago. We oh, developed right. a, a solar lantern which is for um, uh, for houses which were previously burning uh, kerosene for lighting, which is quite dangerous and it's also expensive. Yeah. Whereas a solar lantern, I hope this work, still works, it's 20 years old. Yay! Uh, <laughs> so people could use this. Uh, this is old technology, of course. And nowadays they use LEDs and they use um, uh, lithium batteries, but uh, th some 50,000 people bought these and used them so kids could do their homework at night. And, oh, wow. uh, in safety. <laughs> That's fantastic. Really, really cool. So we're using a very small solar panel, as you can see down there. That is brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Any questions? Not yet. Come on, guys. Ask your questions. Now's your chance. <laughs> right. So, should we move on to the next bit? Thank you so much, Tracy and Ray. Involved. Yeah, hmm. that was wonderful. <laughs> okay. There you go. I think it's us. Right, okay, so it's a little bit of a, a synchronised dance that we're doing here, but I hope you're, uh, hope you're getting, we're getting through to you okay. Um, so I'm joined by uh, Dr Katie Shanks and we're going to be talking a little bit about how solar panels work. So I think we need to go up to a solar panel yeah, first of all so that, we can, so that we can have a look. So we're in this wonderful field full of solar panels, so we have plenty to choose from. Katie, can you give us a bit of an indication how, how do these things work yep. and, uh, and what they're made of really? Maybe yeah, that's a good so start. the main thing to know is that these panels create electricity from the sunlight and actually in solar panels you have um, something called solar cells, so they're an array of these kind of things. You can see they've got little, whoa, Ooh. it's okay, there's <laughs> an old one. But you can see they've got little metal contacts which is where you solder the metal onto. Oh, yeah. oh they are very fragile. Very fragile. This material, so this is where they put the metal and all the tabbing and stuff onto, um, which is silicon. And also to show you just a little bit of quartz as well. And when I say silicon, I mean things like sand, for example. Um, so yeah, they make these very thin so that they can make more of them very cheap. Um, and so they, this is the material that takes the sun, light from the sun, and generates electricity from it. So I suppose, what, how, do, how do they actually go about making these things? Uh, you kind of said they've got some conductors on there and yeah, silicon. Yeah, so these, these very thin materials uh, really just use lots of chemicals and layers and they put very fine layers together. So they have to get the right balance between um, um, different materials so that they conduct the electricity but also absorb the electricity and be really efficient. Fantastic. And so I guess we're, we're starting to wonder, like, you know, it's a, it's a cloudy day here. I think we'll be talking to our, our site expert, Richard, uh, a little, in a little while later to understand 
are they actually generating electricity? But in the meantime, you know, why why should we bother capturing energy from the sun? You know, how much sun, how much energy does it produce, and can we, how can we make use of that? Yeah. So um, one uh, one of the most common facts in the solar energy world is that there's actually enough energy from the sun falling in one hour to supply the whole world with energy. So there is enough energy there, um, and it's just that we have to capture just a little amount of that, and that'll be enough for us. So it's literally one hour of sunshine across the whole earth. Yep means that we can we could power the entire earth for a year yeah so it's i mean amazing. lights falling everywhere so there's an abundance of energy yeah and of course i suppose we can't capture that completely you know you'd have to just cover the earth with a massive solar panel. <laughs> but even if i suppose we could take a tiny tiny proportion of that then then we could use enough to generate enough for say a village or a, a local community exactly i mean so, one of the advantages of solar energy is you can you can put it anywhere you know you can have little small solar cells or really big arrays like this fantastic that's super Super cool and, and what a what an amazing start. I wonder have we got any questions from, from the live chat? So <laughs> Well, millions of questions have suddenly come through. I think we had a technical issue. <laughs> okay, so um, so yeah, let, which one should we ask? Uh, Holberton Primary School, Ryla. I hope I said that right. Um, why do you have so many solar panels in one field? I don't know who wants to answer that one. <laughs> why do we have so so many solar panels in one field? <laughs> <laughs> Tracy's gonna to generate as much power as we can. We get nearly seven and a half megawatts of energy from this one huge solar farm. So that's why we do it. And we've got a question from Lacan. Um, how many solar panels does the farm have? The <laughs> solar farm has twenty thousand panels. So I think that's right, Richard. That's a lot 20, of panels. Just, yeah. just over twenty thousand three hundred and twelve, I think. Okay. What other ones have we got? I'm trying to get what make sure we're doing ones from different schools. Um, oh, sorry. Hold on. Oh, someone's asked, do they work at night? <laughs> Unfortunately, no, they, they don't work at night. No, not at night. Okay. But we've got a whole day that we can generate loads of electricity. So um, I think we'll move on to the next part and then we'll keep answering your questions as we go along, if that's yes, all right. Brilliant. So I'm going to be speaking to David next and... Um, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're still doing our little synchronised dance here, but hopefully that's all, all working okay. So David, you're going to tell us a little bit more about these panels and how they work. So what, what's the kind of mechanism? How do they, how do they generate electricity? How do they generate electricity? Yes. That's a, it's always an interesting <laughs> question, isn't it? Because the, these materials are, are quite different. You heard they're made from sand, so they're not going to work as you might expect them to be. So, but we have things that you're fami familiar with are things like a wooden spoon. Now this is a very bad conductor. No electric will go from one end to the other. Then we have this wonderful metal spoon. So this is a good conductor of electricity. But what we have here is something which is in, in between. So it, it's, it can be a conductor if we give it a little bit of help. So the help comes from sunlight. Okay, so, and there is a lot of energy up there that we can, that we can capture. Okay, but not all of it is useful. So what, so the one way I've thought about it is, imagine you, there's a stream. Okay, now if you can jump across to the other side of the stream, then you, got the equivalent of enough energy to make this material to uh, to conduct electricity but you can't go in two jumps so you only got to have one big jump and uh, and that's how we can make these these um materials work as a kind of a completes an electrical circuit which we can then use as we've heard to power all of these wonderful devices that we use Brilliant. day so, in and day out so let, let's see if i understand this properly then so you need to have enough energy to get these conducting so you need a big jump of energy yeah and they get that from the sunlight from the sunlight yeah and I, there's a there's a, a way of thinking about this i suppose is that light has lots of different energies and in fact you probably all heard of radio waves and ultra 
ultraviolet waves um, and that's all the same type of light right but yes. just in different yes. at, at a different energy yes. so in this case we we need to have enough energy so about visible light and maybe even more energetic like ultraviolet and, and of course you put sun cream on in the summer right and that's to protect you from ultraviolet yeah. light so i suppose we need really a strong amounts of energy to to get these solar panels yeah so so the you, you probably know you can all see colors like blue green and red so the, these are the ones we're all familiar with but if we go just to the to the the edges of those colors we're still able to to capture them so this is so this is the energy that's enabled us to get across the stream and make this circuit work fantastic thank you so much david <laughs> um and i'm just going to see if we've got any more questions from alice and then we need to pass on because uh, you've got an engineering challenge to do everybody so uh, <laughs> okay we've got a question from um Hi View, Alex, how much has it cost to build the solar farm? I don't know who knows that one. <laughs> Sorry Ray, it's, we keep putting uh, on the spot. quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> now the total cost of this solar farm is I believe approximately uh, six million pounds. So uh, anybody want to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a question from Holberton. Um, will they eventually make solar panels blend into the environment more? That's a nice question. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's a really good question. And yes, that is one of the things that we're working on at the university is getting something called building integrated solar panels. And it's about you can have solar panels that are different colours and you can also make them transparent or semi-transparent. So you can have them in buildings or on your electric car or yeah i think they will even have uh, them designed to be either blended into the scenery or maybe making some kind of art artistic kind of feature or statement for different you know places fantastic thank you um let's see oh and we've got another one from holberton um maya says do solar panels last forever <laughs> Do they last forever? This, this is a good question. Um, probably, probably not, but um, they're, they're supposed to last about 25 years is what we hear. But down here, we often find that sometimes they, they may work well until seagulls visit them, or sometimes they, they crack, or sometimes ultimately they may just like um, fatigue and, and become tired the materials will crack but but in principle the fundamentals will work f forever it's just the systems that we have often fail brilliant and a really quick one from Lara Green Beth would like to know when did you build the solar farm I can't remember if we said that <sighs> so work was completed in December 2019 so it's been around 18 months now that it's been operational fantastic thank you great question fantastic questions going to pass on to Adam now and then you're going to do your engineering challenge so Adam thank you so we've got a challenge for you a really exciting challenge you've heard from David and Katie about the amazing materials that have been used to manufacture and make these remarkable devices that take sunlight and make electricity you've heard from Tracy and Ray how much money they've spent on building this amazing park. So if you invest, use all this money and take these materials, you have to build them correctly. And what we want you to decide is, let's just pan the camera down these panels here. And what we want you to consider is, if you were given all these thousands of photovoltaic panels and a field nearby to Plymouth where we are how would you build them which direction of the compass would you point them in that's the first how much would you tilt them would you put them flat would you put them vertical would you put them somewhere in between and if so how much in between Let's just think, let's have a look at the ground down here. We're in a field, a normal farmer's field. And we've got to decide if we have a field that's a bit boggy. I'm sure you've all been walking out on Dartmoor, for example, and it's a bit uh, soft underfoot or hard underfoot. What do you need on your ground under you? 
And then let's just pan round this field. We see hedgerows, we see trees, we see wood. In some areas where we build these expensive farms, we see buildings as well. Do we want to build these panels near those hedges? Do we want to build them near the trees where they might get some nice shade out and cool them down out of the sun? Do we want to build them near a lake? Do we want to put them where? So four questions I want you to answer. Which direction of the compass do we point these in here in Devon? Which tilt do we want? And how tilted? Perhaps we can actually look at an angle down, down these panels. What type of ground do we want to build? And what do we want to know about the hedgerows, trees and buildings? So I want you, with your teacher, over the next five, seven, eight minutes, to reach as a class a conclusion to those four questions. Okay, we've been getting some answers from you guys, some superb answers. We've been told 45 degrees south is a good idea. And do you know what? I think you are plum on and correct. So why do we want to face south? Well, we live in the northern hemisphere and you'll notice that the sun rises if you get up early in the morning in the east it travels round to be its highest in the south and sets in the west and it's strongest round about midday and that's when we get most of this valuable energy resource the sunshine that has just come out just as we talk about it now so to get most of that sunshine we want to point our panels more or less south now at different times of the year the sun is at different heights in the sky. In winter, if you get up in January and have a look, the sun is low in the sky. And it would might be better to have our panels more vertical facing south. But in summer, it's quite like today, it's quite high in the sky. And um, it would be better to have our panels flat. So with a compromise, we want to go somewhere in between. And you're quite right to suggest 45 degrees south, or even better, about 30 degrees south. We want it on firm ground, and we want to be away from trees and shadowing. So I'm going to pass on so we can learn more in some interviews here. So let me pass this over. We're going to hear from experts. Hello. Hi. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm back with Richard again, who knows all about this site, um, and we're going to do a little, a little demo here. Hold on. Whoa. I'll just... Nat, do you want to... <laughs> shall I give this to you? <laughs> you might want to want to... <laughs> there we go. Okay, so hopefully you all know that the Earth goes merrily around the Sun every 365.25 days, and that's... And it also spins around as it's doing that every 24 hours. So it's going around, 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 around like this. But... Um, that's why it looks like the sun goes across the sky. It's not that the sun's going around us, it's that we're spinning around. And the path that the sun appears to take across the sky depends on where you live. Um, so we are up here in the, in the northern hemisphere up here. Um, and the other really important thing is that the earth is tilted on its axis as it spins around like this. So sometimes in the summer, we are tilted towards, so like this, towards the sun. And then in the winter, we are tilted away from the sun in the northern hemisphere. So we always think that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, but actually it varies quite a lot throughout the year. Um, so that's an important thing to think about when you're thinking about the angles. So, so how does that factor in? Um, in terms of the location here. So why, why is this the optimal angle and, and way to face? <laughs> so we, we're facing um, due south and we're optimised on these panels if you want to take a look here. We're optimised roughly at 20, 20 degrees. 20 degrees is it? Yeah. Interesting, okay. 
Um, that's Interesting. due in part as well due to the location. If we make them slightly too high, then they become a lot more visual to the um, to the public. So it's it, it's in relative in, in relativity to the actual the planning of the area and the park. Also. Okay, so there's a lot of factors to think yeah, about. Lots you. Of What's factors, yeah. best in terms of energy gathering, but also what you know, what makes it less visually, yeah, visually unappealing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots to think about there. Cool. And and what other sort of engineering challenges are there on this site? I mean, you know, for example, does it you know does it snow here? And if it does, what what happens with the panels? So the again going back to the angle, we look for a, an angle that we can actually allow any snow um, to run off yeah. gradually, and also the panel, the angle of the panel being at 20 degrees also helps sort of give it a wash when yeah. it rains. And we had some questions about that actually, about, about what happens when it rains, can you still generate energy yeah. when it's raining? So actually what we have at the moment is quite the cloudy day, if 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 we can look at the clouds and uh, we can do a quick measurement of the irradiance value of the sun. Oh cool, do you want to show it to the... So we'll I don't know take if they can this and it. we line this yeah. up to the... Can I throw you the sun? Oh yeah, give me the sun. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, bye bye, come here. <laughs> so we take an angle, we, t we, we line the measurement device to the same angle as the panel, then we take a reading and it shows that we've actually, I don't know if you can see that, we've got 468 of watts per square meter and uh, in this area during optimum time if the sun is shining very brightly we should normally get between 12,000 and 1200 watts per square meter. So today you can see it's cloudy yet we're still generating um, quite good power. Right, so we've had a, a few questions through. So um, uh, from Lara Green, Lexi has asked, what happens if the panels are hit by lightning? Anyone know if that's happened? <laughs> so we, we have had some sites in the past which uh, have been struck by lightning. So we've got special protection devices um, within the circuitry of the external circuitry of the panels to avoid any further damage um, down the line into the electricity side of things. Yes. They call surge protection devices. Right. And once if uh, if an in, in, if a, a lightning sort of strike did happen, it would sort of mitigate the risk or lessen the risk of any damage further on the of the components within the circuit. Brilliant, brilliant, lovely, jubbly. So thank you so much, Richard. That was fantastic. No <laughs> Hi everyone, I want you to just think to yourself what you'd do if you had half a million pounds. The reason I ask that is that Katie, Katie Shanks, has just won a prestigious, important research council award worth half a million pounds. And she's decided not to buy chocolate, not to go on holiday, but to investigate new exciting photovoltaic solar panels. So Katie, tell me about your research and your concentrating cells. Yep, so one of the things I look into is solar concentrators, which just means that you um, combine optics with smaller solar cells. So this is all about reducing the amount of expensive photovoltaic material that we were just talking about, um, but still getting the same energy output. So I've got a big lens here, for example, which is a high concentration device. And I've also got these little lenses, which you can combine with little solar cells um, for building integrated solar cells that we were talking about. I've got a little sample here to show a bit more of that if I can get it out my pocket. So for example you can see them there, the lenses and then the little solar cells at the back. It's all about reducing the amount of material that you need but increasing their efficiency and their power output with optics. So I'm looking into that and looking at making them smaller, smaller optics, smaller materials that can be integrated into buildings. And one of the materials that I look at is is materials in nature. So I'm looking at nanostructures in, in butterfly wings and moth eyes. So moth eyes are very absorbing. So you copy these nanostructures to make solar cells more efficient. So that's really amazing. We can think of a butterfly then as a little sunshine catching animal. Yeah. And the butterflies are using their wings to catch the sunshine energy 
warm up and fly and you're trying to copy that yep, exactly. into materials that we put onto buildings. Yeah so there is the cabbage white butterfly you might have seen it's a little white butterfly and it usually basks in the morning to heat up its flight muscles it sunbathes because uh, butterflies need to have warm muscles before they can fly and so they have reflective wings and it's their nanostructure which reflects light in a kind of like a funnel down to their, their bodies so I'm doing the same but with solar cells. Thank you, that's just remarkable. Do we have any questions? I think what we're going to do with questions is we're going to process those at the end and if we've got time we'll, we'll put them through and we'll definitely make sure we've got time to answer them after the event as well um, but we, we just need to make sure that you uh, you know get to your lunch on time as well so I'm, I'm, I'm going to very quickly speak to, to David now about his amazing research at Plymouth University can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing David? Okay Natalie yes so so we've been we're interested in in solar panels as you can you can guess and and we work with um panels like this which you can see on the farm so we, we do a lot of so we combine t research with teaching as well so we also play around we've got students to make panels themselves so these are all from little individual cells and some of these are all connected all lined up together and some of them are all kind of connected stacked one on top one on, one on top of each other <laughs> okay so but as you can see, what if you look, if you can capture these here, you can see all these metal lines on the on the cells. Now, for us, this is a this is a bit of a problem because every piece of this metal means we get less light, and hence we can get less energy. So, so the things that we've been working on are trying to come up with a cell where all these m metallic layers are not actually on the front; they're on the back. And you think, how do we do that? And it's not so easy. Not so easy, but we have got some that we have made. Again, you may be able to see. So this is now looking at the back side of the panel. So, so in terms of this, this is what, what is under here kind of thing in terms of the cell. So, so what we've done here is we've put all of those metal layers essentially onto, onto this side here. So what you can see are these you can see a gold square and you see a rectangle in the middle now that rectangle in the middle um, it looks the same as around the outside it's because it's got a very very thin layer of graphene that we use here and this is where we we're able to kind of replicate what happens with a big solar panel and and still create an electrical circuit in so, exactly the same way. So David, what is graphene? What we is might have heard about graphene. There's a lot of talk about graphene. What, what is it? What's it's it a, made it's, of? It's a, it, you're all familiar with honeycomb, I guess. We, we, Anna Kate could have bought lots of honeycomb with her grant. So if you imagine like a, the honeycomb structure, it's all kind of hexagonals and it's, it's just one layer of carbon atoms. Okay. So carbon, and we're made up of carbon, pretty much. Yeah, we're so carbon life forms. So, so, so carbon's a very, element. very available material, okay. but in this form, it's very, very difficult to work with. Very, very difficult. So, so we're keen to try and use other materials that can be uh, used to replace graphene because this little cell here will take several days to make. Right. So it's not, it's not really commercially available sustainable or uh, at all at the minute so but i suppose i guess i'm wondering you know why do we need to look for replacements for the materials in here are any key benefits i guess that key, we... key things are one remove all these these metallic layers because these are like these are all losses these are things we can kind of uh you know improve upon but we heard about tilt angles can we make a, a material where the, 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 the light is absorbed at, at all angles equally. This is one. And also we know that the sunlight has got these colors that we can see, the blues, reds, and greens, but it's got the, the, other, the other kind of, we say colors, but we can't see them, but they're, they're about, can we collect them? And also most of, the, most of the energy is in this green. And that's where these cells panels don't work very well. So can we make, them work much better where most of the sunlight is yet still capture the 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 kind of the energy that we 
can present. So I suppose it's all about making them a bit more efficient and yes. making them maybe even a lower environmental footprint because they take a lot of energy to make these yeah. things, but they do tend to make that back in a number of years, uh, you know, maybe two or three years, I yeah. suppose. Um, so I think we need to move on to questions. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> um, and so have we got any questions, Alice, from, from the audience that we can answer just now? We have hundreds of questions. Thank you so much. And we will make sure that these are all answered after the event. Sorry that we won't get to all of them. But um, we have the question, um, why don't solar panels overheat? And that is from uh, Lara Green Rio. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, so they are designed so that they've got this big area behind them and there's lots of air flowing to cool them down. And when it's even higher temperatures, sometimes they can have things like water passing through and sometimes that heated water can be solar thermal. So you, use electric you get electricity and heat energy out of it. And that's one of the things I look into is because when you're concentrating light onto solar cells, they get really hot. And so can you take that excess heat away as well? So lots of different ways. We've had a question from Holberton Primary School, Evo. Is it possible to put solar panels on the back of your phone so that you can charge it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can. Um, so there are little solar panel packs you can get for backpacks and mobile phones um, and it would charge it. Yeah, that's, you can get them. Oh, another a great question from Holberton Primary School. Um, why don't you make it so that solar panels can follow the sun? <laughs> so we already have um, systems and sites in place uh, where we use what they call a tracking system which tracks the sun from morning to evening time. Um, the system is worked via hydraulics on a roller system. So yeah, they are available and also you know in, in place and installed on many sites across across the world now. So we're coming towards the end of our broadcast today. And what have we learnt? We've learnt that all the people that we've spoken to today and all sorts of scientists and engineers are constantly inventing and creating. Everything, look around your classroom, everything in there has been invented by someone who was once a child, once a student, who believed in themselves, I can go on to invent. And you can do it really simply. One final thought. We saw those new photovoltaic materials made of the material called graphene. The people at Manchester University won something you'll have heard of. The Nobel Prize for that invention of graphene. And to invent graphene, all they needed was a graphite pencil and some sellotape. They drew on a piece of paper and you will have probably done this experiment that your pencil line being made of this interesting stuff graphite carbon conducts electricity and they wondered how thin they could make that pencil line by sticking sellotape onto the pencil line and taking the top layer off and making it thinner and thinner and they ended up with the thinnest possible layer which actually worked better they expected it to get worse so they made a Nobel Prize winning invention into these photovoltaic panels with a normal pencil and some sellotape. You guys, if you think, invent, communicate, collaborate, you'll be an engineer because that's what engineers do. They think, they invent. Natalie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you all for joining us. So Holberton Primary School, Lara Green, Highview and Ivy Bridge Community College. Thank you so much for joining us. We loved your questions and we're going to answer the rest of them after this event as well, because we've had so many. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our amazing engineers and site experts who've joined us today. And we're absolutely thrilled. And we, we hope you've learned a lot about engineering and how exciting it is. And hopefully some of you in future will become engineers as well. Thank you all so much for joining us and um, and yep that's it from us.